Tonight's meeting of the Hand Eye Supply Curiosity Club. We're your hosts this evening. I'm Tobias, and this is Will. And together, we have a number of curious and exciting topics to share with you. As attendees of the Hand Eye Supply Curiosity Club, you're all now members, provided you ad adhere to our philosophy. <laughs> Ex curiositas scientia. We pledge to learn without prejudice in pursuit of our mutual goal, perpetual novice. We admit that it is impossible to know everything about anything, and thus we remain perpetually curious. Scott Franklin, the lightning bolt represents the receipt of knowledge, the enlightenment of illumination, the resonance of truths understood. It awakens and excites us and makes us hungry for more. Curiosity Club is made merrier by our fellow artisans at Fort George Brewery in Astoria, Oregon. And now, let's give a warm Curiosity Club welcome to Michael Madigan of Kitchen Crew and Bowery Bagels and Remedy Wine Bar. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. All right, well, thank you all for showing up tonight. Um, I will, uh, oh, you know what, the first thing I'm going to do, and this is very important for all of you, is I'm going to set a timer. Because I've done what I usually do, which is I put way too much information on way too many slides. And uh, I promise you I'm not going to just sit here and read every one of them. So uh, what I like to do is answer questions. Otherwise, I'm just going to be sitting here droning for about 50 minutes or so. So please, uh, if you've got a question on anything I'm covering or if I don't cover something, because like I said, I probably have you know, way too much stuff in the bag, just raise your hand. I have these lights in my eyes. So if I don't see you, just you know, really kind of make an effort or call my name out or say, hey, dummy, or whatever it is. So, um, but if you see me fumbling with this, I'm not taking a call. I'm just making sure I'm not running over time. So uh, as the folks said, I run, you know, what we first started with, and it's actually four years ago almost to the day that we opened Kitchen Crew Culinary Incubator right across the street, uh, right across Flanders over here. So I thought I would tell you what, what a culinary incubator is. Basically, we designed a 4,800 square foot commercial kitchen to be used by food startups. So people who have a really good idea, they've got passion, 
uh, they want to produce a product or they want to get to the point where they open a restaurant or they're a caterer or whatever it might be, we've got a facility where they can come and create their product. So I think we have something in common with what, uh, with what Handi does. We support makers. I mean, I, like, I kind of like that word, so uh, I've adopted it a little bit. Um, we've got a licensed uh, kitchen. We've got more equipment than most people know what to do with. In fact, most of the equipment came through what, what at the time was Johnson Restaurant Supply right here in this building. This was his warehouse. Um, on top of that, I provide a series of uh, business development capabilities, everything from brand identity to sales marketing and distribution to helping them set up their books. Basically, just taking people who don't have a basic understanding of business and helping them create one from the ground up. So that's enough about me. I'm going to go back a little bit in history, and some of you guys uh, may know all about this. And again, I'm not, this isn't going to be an intensive history lesson. But I'm going to start right after World War II, because that's where some things that people don't normally think of having influences on food uh, had influences on food. Things that everyone thinks of, right, is we used to have small family farms. Now we have consolidation. That really started picking up steam after the Depression. It took a hiatus during World War II. But post-World War II, you saw a lot of consolidation on farm. You also saw mechanization. Uh, mechanization had happened in the early 20th century, late 19th century, in the farm products as commodities you know, for things like grain and cotton, the cotton gin and all those things we know about. But you started seeing some real specialized equipment like fruit pickers and, and corn harvesters and you know, combines that could do multiple things so that farmers could farm more land in a given day. Um, the same thing started happening in manufacturing and distribution. So this, you know, if you think about, you know, you'll hear me refer to food sometimes, and don't take it wrong, as, as, as raw materials or commodities. I mean, if you take what's growing in the ground or on the land or in the water, somebody has to manufacture that. Somebody takes it and turns it into an edible product, uh, you know, for the most part. Obviously, there's raw produce that we eat and things, but that level of manufacturing. And then, of course, you've got to get that food to people. So all these met networks kind of built up after World War II and it really picked up steam in the 50s when the interstate highway started happening. But basically what it did is it, 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 is it gave people access to that, to that mass production. The other thing that was kind of, a, um, again, a, a behind the scenes thing is frozen foods. Um, Clarence Birdseye invented the process for, to freeze food you know, 40, 50 years before World War II and before the 50s. But commercial refrigeration wasn't readily available until after World War II. Commercial refrigeration was, and air conditioning was largely developed to support troops overseas, particularly in the Pacific. So when all that, not just the technology, but the building capacity, right? All of a sudden, the war machine didn't need it anymore. They had to keep buying pro building product, which meant that they had to keep selling product. And the natural place to sell that was to food manufacturers and food producers. Uh, and then the other thing that happened, of course, was convenience food and packaged foods. And the, the primary example of that is obviously things like um, TV dinners, right? Everyone thinks about the TV dinner coming out in the 50s. But if you trace back a lot of the foods that are available today, some of them were available in the early 20th century, but the real mass production of things like, you know, saltines and Oreos and, you know, craft singles and, you know, all those things really started as a result of having access to this technology and also this level of mass commodity uh, to, 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 to produce it. The other thing that started happening was, you know, better living through science. And so um, I'm going to talk about fertilizers first. You know, does anybody know the reason why you, you can build bombs out of fertilizers? Because those chemicals were developed in World War II to be bombs. I mean, all those chemicals that go into fertilizers got their start as high explosives during World War II. And it was the same thing that happened. Once the war machine didn't need it anymore, these companies had to adapt their products so they could keep manufacturing them and not just shut down and not lose the revenue streams and not let everybody go. And it turned out that the things like you know, nitrogen and, and phosphate and all those things that go into bombs also go into fertilizers. So the, ability, you know, the, the ready access and really the inexpensive nature of these chemical fertilizers you know, obviously had an impact on, on production. Um, hybridization, people got a lot smarter. I mean, hybridization used to be farmers would save seed crop. And has anyone here farmed or like worked on farms or anything? Okay, so, you know, the way that traditionally it would work is farmers would set aside a portion of their crop as seeds for the next harvest. And hybridization was, you know, some, some might have done something, but usually they would say, okay, I'll kind of like the characteristics of this one or this, you know, whatever. But they would save that and then they would put it in the ground the next year. Uh, hybridization, once companies like Man Monsanto and some others started taking it over, they got very specific on how they wanted to develop their food. And very little of it had to do with does it taste good and, you know, is it highly nutritious? And it all had to do with things like higher yields 
and uh, longer growing seasons and disease resistance and pest resistance, durability. So, you know, there's a reason why you see these, tom I, I always use tomatoes as an example, right? I mean, who here likes eating supermarket tomatoes in December? You know, they're unnatural. But they're, they've been bred to be that way. They've been bred to stay red. They've been bred not to bruise when they're shipped. They've been bred to, you know, to do these certain things, you know, to not have blemishes. That's purely a result of, of hybridization at a scientific level. Um, Pesticides, I think we all understand you know, the issue with pesticides. The one thing I want to point out is this is when you started seeing things like systemics. And what a systemic is, the plants actually absorb the pesticide into their biology so that they are, they are resistant to those pests. So there's no way to avoid, you can't wash a vegetable and get rid of a systemic pesticide. It's in the vegetable. Um, monoculture is a concept that basically says we bred out biological diversity. So monoculture says, Things like 80% of the corn in the United States is the same hybrid of corn. You know, it's, it's, it's the reason why you see heirloom things disappearing and now starting to make a comeback. But it's, you know, it's things like that that say, okay, we're seeing the disappearance of variety and diversity and, you know, not only are we giving up things like flavor and texture and all, you know, just, just the natural joy that comes from eating different foods, but that also leads to things like uh, collapse of that. So, you know, if you just have a monoculture and then all of a sudden, like, well, let's use the potato blight in, in Ireland in the 1840s, if something happens, well, that can all get wiped out. And so, uh, it, rather than take that risk, you start seeing things like uh, GMOs take place. So, let's just take this monoculture and let's do a, gemeti a genetic modification to it so that it's disease resistant or it's pest resistant so those things don't happen. Um, unfortunately, that starts having an impact on other members, whether they're plant or animal, of, of the ecosystem. And there are a lot of people who think that one of the reasons for a colony collapse disorder in honeybees, if you're familiar with that term, there's, there's been massive die-offs of high percentage of honeybee hives, has to do with the fact that, um, that there's monoculture agriculture out there. So uh, again, the, the theme is a towards higher production and, and then, of course, lower cost, which I think I'm going to talk about next. But same with livestock. I'm not going to go through all this. Um, but the same issues with plant material that you see, you see with livestock, disappearing breeds, uh, things that are bred to, to mature faster. You know, the, the average life of a chicken, you know, that's bought in a supermarket is somewhere around four to five weeks. I mean, these things, you know, whereas if you had chickens on a farm or if you grow some at home, it, it can take three times that for them to reach maturity. Uh, chickens are bred to have larger breasts because people tend to like the white meat instead of the dark meat. Uh, in fact, it gets so bad with turkeys that you can actually go out there and search it. There are turkeys that can't walk because when they get mature, they're, they're, they're so top-heavy from, uh, from having so much breast meat. Um, whereas free-range and pasture-range used to be the norm, and luckily now we're seeing that come back. We went towards these things called CAFOs, Concentrated Animal Feed uh, uh, Operations. I almost said organizations. This is the bad stuff. This is where you see things like, you know, the, these, these are the things that PETA puts videos out of. These are you know, concentrated feedlots. These are, you know, row upon row upon row of animals that don't have any room to move. Um, they are bathed in antibiotics because that is, a, you know, w between the proximity, uh, their own feces, uh, you know, everything that's going on there, they need a lot of, uh, they actually need medical support to keep, to keep them from dying off in large numbers. And that's where you start seeing, you know, issues with things like antibiotics in the, uh, in the food chain. So same issues with livestock as there are with plants. There are other, again, less obvious uh, influences that kind of led towards, uh, you know, this uh, mass production. Government subsidies. I mean, as, as more and more, uh, I forget how many billions of dollars, I should have researched it, but corn, sugar, dairy, soybeans, pretty much anything out there that you can think of, there's some farm bill subsidy for. But those are the big ones. I mean, those are the big four. And that's the reason why you see so many of those, uh, of those ingredients in the food you eat. So if you pick up a piece of processed food and you read the packaging, it's going to contain many, if not each, of those four ingredients because the government makes it very inexpensive to do so. And industry's gotten really good at it. I'm going to recommend a book later on where, where they talk about um, corn and what's going on with corn. I mean, just, corn is used for a lot more than animal feed and to feed humans. In fact, something like only 3% of the corn that's developed is actually eaten as corn on the cob. Most of it goes to animal feed. But 
Companies have gotten so good at cracking corn into elemental things like corn syrup and corn starch and cellulose and all these other things that apparently at the end of the manufacturing chain that's processing corn, all that's coming out is a trickle of water. They're using almost every bit of that corn to create other products because the government makes it easy to do it. So if someone tells you we have to have a farm bill because it's for cheap food, it's not for cheap food, it's for cheap ethanol. Um, Distribution's a big deal, right? If, if you're producing all these products, you've got to get them to consumers. And so uh, large you know, supermarket chains went national and even global. You started seeing big retailers pop up, of which obviously you know, Walmart is the one everybody likes to pick on. But it goes beyond that. It's a global market, right? Seasonality has almost disappeared. Like I said, you can get a tomato in December if you want it. You can eat asparagus in, in, uh, in October. You can, you can get cherries from Chile in, in you know, what, you know, whatever the opposite of you know, spring is. What is it? September, October, right? <laughs> Grapes, you know, all those things. It's, it's beef from Australia. People are, people are drinking, you know, there's, there's water that you can get from France or Italy or Germany. I mean, you know, World Foods around the corner over here has a sparkling water shelf that probably has water from a dozen countries in it. And, and I buy it sometimes if I want some sparkling water. I mean, it's just, it's just how it is now. So that access to, at the consumer level, any ingredient you want, we expect that now, right? I mean, people, I try, I, I've, the more I've learned about this over the last several years, the more I try to, you know, to not do that. So, you know, if, if I, you know, we run Bowery Bagels and between October and June, on our BLT, we don't use fresh tomatoes because I know, I, I know they're not coming from somewhere I want to buy them. I know the quality isn't good. So what we do is every fall, we make big batches of tomato jam, and in the winter, we use tomato jam on, on our BLT. So I mean, there are things you can do. On the other hand, you know, I still have avocados that people want on there. So if people want an avocado on there, you know, I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you we had avocados. But where I can make a difference, I can. But my point is, it's a global market now. And of course, what all that adds up to as well is what people don't think about is, what's the carbon footprint of growing manufacturing, transporting, and merchandising all that food. I mean, if you think about it, um, you know, every step of the way, you're using hydrofuels to do that. And, and so there's, a, there's an impact beyond just what's on the, on the plate or in the package uh, that has as big an, an impact on the environment as what the growing practices do. So I think that's my last uh, history, part of history. Any, have, have any questions on it? I know I kind of went at warp speed through that, but like I said, I just wanted to kind of use that to set up where we are today. So where we ended up, easy access to inexpensive food. The United States citizens spend less per capita on food than almost any other country in the world because it's inexpensive and, and it's set up to be that way. Part of that is the subsidies that we already talked about, but in addition to it being inexpensive, it's not very nutrient dense. I mean, you know, Food manufacturers have figured out that what people like to eat are fat, sugar, and salt. And so that's pretty much what goes into processed foods. Um, <clears throat> again, focused on low cost and high volume rather than nutrition. Uh, I spoke about chemical and biological agents. By chemicals, I mean things like systemics, both on the surface as well as in. Biological, I mean that's you know, directly GMOs. And then um, this is a big issue around the country. And I mean, California is, you know, if you like produce from California, eat it over the next year or two because they are almost in <laughs> dust bowl status right now. I mean, it's really, I know people who live in the Sacramento area and they're in a panic. They're in a lather over this because they don't know where the water's going to come from. Um, this is a bigger issue. To me, I mean, not a bigger issue, but this is the one that was, was almost tragic. And I think we caught it just in time, but within a couple of generations, an entire history of food growing, food making, you know, what to do, what grows where and when, how to do it was lost. I mean, it all, it all went away because these products and these crops and things went away and people weren't interested in doing it anymore. Um, most of the government driven solutions have not really worked, whether they're nutrition based, farm based, you know, whatever they are, it hasn't been able to slow that down. And what that means to all of us, and you'll hear me use this word a few times, is a lack of traceability. Traceability is kind of the vogue term these days that says, where does your food come from? If you have something on your plate, whether you made it from stuff you bought at a market, or it's a product that you bought that somebody else made for you, do you know where it came from and what's in it? And that almost disappeared. And in a large case, it still has disappeared. I mean, you, still, you can still read things that have ingredient lists, but it doesn't tell you where they came from. Um, you don't know if it's GMO or not unless the manufacturer decides to tell you that. You know, we came pretty close here in Oregon to passing Measure 92 last year. We were within a few hundred votes um, that would have required GMO labeling. Uh, it took about $20 million of outside money to, to buy those few hundred votes to, to make it go the other way. So this is kind of where things have been. 
Oregon is different, right? We all know that. I'm, I'm not a native. I've been here 28 years now, though. How, who, who, you all, how many here are natives? Wow. Okay, see? So here we go. Congratulations. You, you win the prize. But um, are you even 28, though? I might, be the, I, might, I might have been here longer than you. So... Um, <laughs> I got here at a time when I think Oregon always had a background in uh, in, in in not large scale ag starting and wine the wineries were just catching on and you know. They there was there were microbreweries and Grand Central had just started baking and it was a really neat time to, 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 to be interested in food here. But I think the reason that Oregon kind of leads to, to this day, you know, started early and leads the way is the Willamette Valley kind of always had this um, independent streak and it was always smaller farms. I mean it was always family hazelnut or filbert or you know filbert or, or walnut orchards, it was it was berry farms, it was grass seed farms, uh, wine grapes showed up in the 1960s. Um, so there was always, you know, there was never a large company that said we're going to come in here and farm because there's not that much flat land to do that with. Um, and just because good stewardship, good care of its soil and its water, it's better than it has been in most places. Um, or you know, a lot of water and it's plenty clean. Um, Early, uh, early adoption of organic standards. I mean, that's, you know, that's something that, you know, on a small scale, Oregon has always been interested in, Oregon farmers have. Um, things like urban growth boundaries here in the Portland area that preserve farmland or, you know, in other parts of the state where you can't develop farmland. So, uh, you know, you started seeing things like timberland converted to arable land or grass seed farms converted to, to, to food production and things like that rather than being developed. Um, and as a result of that, there's always been really good consumer access. So, so, you know, when we talk later, I'm going to talk about the fact that there's really kind of three things that are needed to create a sustainable food shed. It's producers, which are farmers and fishermen and ranchers. It's producers, the people who do value-add food production. And then it's the consumer. I mean, none of it matters if you can't make a market. And Oregon has always been successful at a direct-to-consumer type of a market for these products. I got ahead of myself on my slide. I'm sorry. I warned you that I would do that. Um, this is actually a picture from, you know, there's a, if you're not familiar with it, there's an organization out of Eastern Oregon called Shepherd's Grain. And they uh, convince farmers to do no-till farming. So basically not to turn the soil, not to work amendments into it, to do crop rotations, things like that. Um, and we, we use our, our flour for Bowery bagels. We get about six, uh, that's five to 6,000 pounds a week of, uh, of shepherd's grain flour. So this is one of their growers out in Eastern Oregon. Then they mill it there, package it locally. This is actually a little picture of kitchen crew over here just to show that there's processors and producers. So we've got, there's four things happening right here. This is a big stack of chocolate chip cookies. This is a couple of chefs breaking down a couple of hogs. And then this is a guy making salsa back in the background over here. Um, and then the consumers, um, you know, this is, if you're not familiar with an organization called Plate and Pitchfork, they do farm dinners. This is part of, you know, kind of how Oregon has always tried to connect consumers with the people who are making their food. So uh, Plate and Pitchfork actually will seat 120 people out in the middle of a field, just like you see right there. That's a picture I took. I think that's actually a vineyard. That's Domaine Joanne, and you can see kind of the chefs are working in the kitchen. But it's an experience. Part of that is a farm tour. Part of that is you get hands-on with some of what's going on in the farm. So. Um, but these are the connections that you need, in my mind, you know, growers, processors, consumers, to, to create a stable food shed. I'll tell you right away that the part of this I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I keep on kicking that. The part of that that I'm least familiar with are the farmers. I mean, I know a lot of farmers. I've visited a lot of farms. I don't know a lot about the history of farming in Oregon. And what little I was going to make up, I decided not to when Tobias told me his mother was a farmer. Uh, so I'm not going to do that. But, you know, again, I just think that Oregon has always had good land use laws and has always really, no matter what was growing on that land, always did a good job to make sure that it was, it was not going to destroy the land. Um, I already talked about timber and grass seed land converting to arable. Um, it's always been a smaller scale, as I mentioned. Um, there's always been a good variety of things that are grown here. Like I said, everything from, from grapes and hops 
to, uh, to fruits, tree nuts, um, you know, orchards, things like that. Um, a lot of the, because of that biodiversity, a lot, of the sm a lot of the older heirloom breeds are still around. So there are people here who are growing heirloom breeds that are only called heirloom breeds now because that's what we call them because they were almost lost, but they've been growing on those farms for 60 years or more. Um, we've always been strong on, uh, because we have good grassland here of doing pasture raised on our animals. You don't see big, you, I'm not aware of any big feedlot operations here in Oregon for any species. Um, custom grown specialty produce is kind of an interesting one and it's really taken on, taken on in the last few years, but there are farms like Viridian Farms who will go to restaurateurs and say, what do you need? What kind of, or, or they'll go to Europe or South America and come back with these great seeds that aren't being grown here and they'll, they'll put a little land aside to grow a crop that nobody else is growing in the United States and say, how would you use this? Would you like to? Do you want more of this? So does anybody here eat padrone peppers in the summertime? Viridian Farms, Leslie and Manuel, were the first growers of padrone peppers in the United States. They're down in uh, Sand Island, uh, west of Dayton, down, or near Dayton down here. And they literally took seeds back in their pockets from Spain and, and started growing those peppers. That's really how that happened. It was, it's, uh, in the wine industry, they call that a suitcase clone, because you're really not supposed to have it, and it's not been approved, but uh, that's kind of how they do it. They pro well, not anymore. I don't want to get them in trouble. But they probably introduced a dozen fruits and vegetables to the United States that weren't being grown before, and that's happening all over the place. And again, the thing that Oregon's always had is there's always been a strong direct-to-consumer sales thing. Uh, the, the farmers and the growers and the producers have always been able to make a market because there are enough people interested in that here in Oregon to, to do that. CSAs, if you're not familiar, you'll see that show up a few times. That's community supported agriculture. That's basically where you buy a share. Some of you may be involved in that where you say, okay, uh, Deep Roots Farm, I'm going to give you $40 a week. And for that 40, or you know, I'm going to give you all that money at the beginning of your growing season. And every week I'm going to get a box of vegetables from you, fruits and vegetables. And whatever comes, I'm going to make that week. If you guys are interested, there are a ton of CSAs here in Oregon that are really terrific. And uh, it's a great way to learn, you know. We're, we would be in them and we get stuff that's like, how am I going to, you know, how am I going to cook this? I love to cook, but I've never worked with whatever this might have been that showed up in the, in, the, in the box. It's really kind of a cool thing to do. And it's that direct connection. So again, in Oregon, we have great growers, but we also have a great history of producers here in Oregon. And so, um, you know, I, I just made kind of a, it's, this is by no means a comprehensive list, but some of them I really, I, I really like. I am gonna, I'm going to mention Nancy's Yogurt. Anyone here know the history of Nancy's Yogurt and who started that? Ken Kesey actually did that. <laughs> Ken Kesey brought Nancy up. She started as his bookkeeper. He wanted to do an organic dairy. They couldn't sell the milk. He wanted it to be raw. There were all these issues. So they said, well, we're going to have to do some value add to it. We're going to make yogurt. They decided to make yogurt. If you think about, you know, the 70s, yogurt was... I don't know, I grew up, you know, in the 70s, I was still in New York City. Yogurt was kind of exotic to me then, you know. I was like, what's yogurt? Yeah. But they started making yogurt, natural yogurt, and um, Nancy was actually a bookkeeper there, and she eventually started, I forget what it was called. It was probably just like the Keezy Dairy or something like that. But that's how it started. That's how Nancy started. They, they had this dairy herd, and they needed to do something with the milk, and it was, uh, you know, I, I can't believe that's over 40 years ago now. Um, does anybody know what the brand name is behind Turtle Island Foods? I just met this guy two weeks ago. Tofurky. The guy started making it in Hood River, literally in his garage. He was a school teacher in the early 70s. That's how long Tofurky has been around. He wasn't the brand name then, but basically that was the product he was making. Um, big fans, you know, the, you know of, the, of the breweries and the wineries. But again, those folks were able to tell the story of what's in the bottle. And then when you tell the story of what's in the bottle, you have to tell the story about how you grew it. Why does that Widmer Hefeweizen cost twice as much as your bottle of Coors? Well, here's why. The wheat, the hops, everything that's going into that, the local water, our brewing practices, the same with wine. Uh, when Grand Central Baking started, I was so happy because there, you know, there was no artisan bread. There was hardly any artisan bread out here. Where did, where did we go in Portland before Grand Central for you know, a crusty baguette or something like that? I mean, it was, I think there was Bread and Ink Cafe, and that was about it, and you had to go to them. So you know, these folks just started doing what they were doing. And by, I also love the kettle chip story. You guys know the kettle chip story? Again, a guy in Salem, Oregon started that in his garage, a guy named Cameron Healy. And I was actually working for IBM when I came out here in the 80s, and it was not too long after he started. And they sent me out there to go talk to him. He was a Sikh. He had this big, he was very Nordic looking, but he had this long blonde beard down to here, and he wore the robes and the turbans and everything. And he's, he's literally sitting there stirring, <laughs> stirring these big vats of oil with chips in it. 
he had more, it was a big manufacturing by, the, by them, but he was still involved in it. But, you know, these are the kind of things that, um, that Oregon does. People just have these ideas and they do them. And in part, they can do them because he could get potatoes, right? I mean, he could get really good potatoes from Oregon, and that's how he started. Um, but then the tip of the spear and the place where, so, so like I said, with these types of products and more of them, and you, we could probably sit here and come up with a bunch more. Um, you have to, if you're, you have to educate your consumer. And this is where the consumer education started beyond people who are naturally interested. Like I said, what's in the bottle? What's in the loaf of bread? Why is a kettle chip different? You have to educate the consumer. And the real tip of the spear in educating consumers is chefs because people might not, might not always be interested in what's in my bag of chips or I might not eat tofurkey um, or I might not be buying Bob's Red Mill seven grain breakfast cereal. You know, but by God, I like to go out to eat. And so back in the late 80s and early 90s, these were the three chefs who really started doing, in the industry, farm to table is kind of a little bit set aside right now because it's overdone. I mean, like, every, like anything, everybody does it. It's a gold rush. Everyone says, I'm farm to table, I'm farm to table. And you start seeing not only the names of the farms, but the names of the farmers on the menus. And all of a sudden, it's like, you know. <laughs> right? what you, what people are like, Technically, every food comes from a farm, and so the, the, the term gets diluted, and then all of a sudden it doesn't really mean anything anymore. But, you know, there are people who still walk that walk, and, but these guys started it. Greg Higgins, Chris Israel, Corey Schreiber. And if you look at the restaurants that are around today, 25, 30 years later, the family tree of almost any successful chef, particularly the ones who are um, very, uh, you know, doing things sustainably, sourcing things locally, doing all the right things, they come from one of these family trees. They come from one of these family trees. And so that's really where um, consumers start seeing the impact of things like, oh, Padron peppers, or you know, to use that example, Romesco. I mean, who, 25 years ago, I'd never seen Romesco before, and now it's everywhere. Well, some, somebody decided to grow that, and some chef decided to use it, and you know, that's how it works. So the good news is, in Oregon, a very high percentage of us are engaged in, or at least aware of, these types of issues. And I mentioned Measure 92 earlier. I mean. I don't know if there's another state in the union other than maybe Hawaii where there would have been that high a turnout and that high a percentage of voting on, on, a, on a measure that's basically about to most people. So Oregon is, like, like in most other things, Oregon is really plugged into this stuff. Um, as I've mentioned, we have easy access to this super variety of high quality, delicious food. And if you're like me, you want to figure out what to do with it. Um, and again, I'll use myself as an example. Moved out here in the late 80s. By the early 90s, I was, you know, home bread baker, home beer brewer, making wine in my, in my garage. Uh, I learned how to butcher whole animals. I mean, you know, I started making cheese. So, you know, and I'm not unique in that. There, I'm, I would guess that there's a lot of people here who do many of those same things. So, you know, the very, you know, the nature of, of us here is to be DIY and the fact that we're easy to know what they're doing. Great idea. It's, you know, each consumer hands on. But the other is, again, you know, the same way I talked about on large scale, you need retail and distribution. Well, on this smaller scale, you still need retail and distribution. In Oregon in the 90s, we started seeing Nature's Fresh Northwest, right? The people who are now running New Seasons. And New Seasons is one of the biggest supporters of local produce and locally in all of a place like New Seasons that does what they do. And yeah, it costs more to, to shop there, but there's a reason it costs more to shop there. It's all these things we've been talking about. Um, there's lots of food co-ops, right? Food front, food fights. Some of them are targeting it vegan, and some of them are targeting it organic. But you know, the fact that a market can be made locally for these products is really important. And I see the, the impact of that every day with my clients out at Kitchen Crew, right? They're, they're making this great artisan product. Where are we going to go sell it? Um, the fact that we do have a really, sh I mean, the restaurant scene in Oregon, New York Times has a right now. I kid you not. For the last 24 months, I'll bet you there's been at least one or two articles a month about Oregon, about Portland specifically, and mostly it's about restaurants. So we have access to that. And that, again, 
not only do we love the variety and it shows us how to use foods and it's a natural channel for the foods that are being grown here, um, but it gives us ideas to go home and do things on our own um, because we've got an appetite for new, new things here, whether it's for products, whether it's for ethnic foods. I mean, there's a reason that 660 food car carts showed up here over a five year period now. I'll grant that 450 of them are probably crappy, but those other 250, you can find some special <laughs> stuff there, right? I mean, we've all had that experience. Questions? I mean, I feel like I keep on just kind of running on here. Okay. Talk about started back pop up at a kitchen. What's going to happen there? In the crap, so I was like, we'll just do this as a um, we door 20 minutes, the next 160 hour, making about five to six hundred, and they were selling in about an hour. So we said, hey, there's something here. Stumptown actually approached us and kind of forced us into the wholesale business. And bagels is a week to 100 more around, around Portland. So I've lived through this. And my commitment has been I want to use as much local product as I can, non GMO, you know, all the, all the right things. Not because I think it's going to help me sell more bagels or sell them for more money, but it's because I want to do. And it's hard. Now, I'm lucky I've got Shepherd's Grain here. Um, uh, so that's good, but you know, we also make sandwiches. What's a bagel shop if you can't get a bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich in the morning, or if you can't get a you know, pastrami Reuben for lunch? So it, it gets really hard to source. You know, we're, we're selling an entire side of bacon a day, and we're curing the bacon right next door to the kitchen crew. We're, we're, we're grinding our own sausage. We're pretty much everything but the cheese that goes into one of our sandwiches we're making over there. Um, we cure our own Groblox with Columbia River salmon. And it's hard to do the commitment to it because you've got to, a lot of that stuff, there's a spot market in it, which means the price is going to vary, so it's hard to plan. A lot of it is limited supply, so one day we may not be able to get the, uh, the, you know, the, the particular salmon we want or the pork bellies from White Marble Farm or whatever that might be. I'm going through something right now with non-GMO. We use um, a pan spray to coat the pans to keep the bagel from sticking it at some point. Well. We are selling to one of the one of the food co-ops that says you've got to give me a non-GMO statement. It turns out that the pan spray we've been using has will not certify that 100% it's non-GMO. There's a non-GMO spray out there, and it costs more, but you don't use a lot of that, so the impact wouldn't be huge. Here's where the huge impact is: it's got different ingredients. I have an ingredient label. I'll have to go out. And, you know, I've got 2,000 ingredient labels. That you know, what do I do? Do I wait until I don't have those labels anymore, and then switch to the new one, or do I throw those labels out and kind of eat that cost? So, for uh, it's a complex supply chain that goes beyond just you know what you would normally think it goes, what it goes into. Um, but we do it because we feel good about it, and we've for the, for the most part been able to convince our customers that there's a reason why we do it and why our stuff costs a little more but that's why it tastes better and it's better for you and it's better for you know the food shed um, some buy that some don't I mean you know it's, it's, it's always I try not to read Yelp reviews because I just don't believe in, in Yelp but you know I, I, I do go out there and monitor it just to make sure that if there's a trend or something I really need to know about you know I have people telling me why do you use this, fa literally, why are you using this fancy white cheddar cheese? Why don't you just put American cheese on there? Well, it's, it's freaking Tillamook vintage aged white cheddar that's made here in Oregon. It's like one of the best cheeses. They import it all over the place, and that's why I'm using it, because it's, it's local, it's delicious, it's not, you know, they do all the right things in, raising, in, in the co-op to raise their cows, but some don't care. We were lucky here in Oregon that a lot do, and a higher concentration here in Portland, but some don't. And I'll tell you, it's hard to keep that commitment. I mean, you know. If, if, if I could drive 7 or 8 percent, you know, out of my cost by going non-GMO or, or by buying, you know, Pillsbury flour instead of Shepherd's Grain flour, um, um, the temptation is always there. And it's really hard to stick to it from a producer standpoint. So if you as consumers ever wonder about things like that, I'll tell you, it's hard to keep that commitment. If people are doing it, you know, if it's going to cost you 50 cents more to buy your sandwich at lunch, you know, I'd urge you to do it, particularly if it's on a bagel. <laughs> Um, my point on this slide is these are, you know, as a producer or as a grower or as a consumer, these are the things that you can do to learn more. These are all education points, and they're all readily go. know you go to one where the actual farm to 
who are selling. That's a bad thing. But if you get a chance there to talk to the people who are actually, you know, you can tell by what their fingernails look like 100% of the time. You can tell by what their, what their hands look like. You can tell if they're a farmer or not. Um, you can visit farms. You can join CSAs, which I talked about. Um, New Seasons does a great job with retail merchandising with their local fines program and some different things. And I got to say, I'm going to give Whole Foods credit. They've really been trying here in the Pacific Northwest as well. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of online print and broadcast media here that's food centric, so I would, I would look for some of those resources as well. It's a lot. Big fan. That's why after 20 computers, I said my next food, and it's going to be going to be helping people get their hands. Um, but the other thing is it becomes personalized. When you talk about this stuff, it's big macro issues, right? It's GMOs and it's systemics and it's, you know, it's, it's all this big scary stuff to most people who don't have that natural curiosity. Um, but if you can get somebody engaged through a restaurant experience or, hey, I'm going to make bread at home or I'm going to cook this, I'm going to figure out how to use romesco. You know, I keep using romesco because it's such a weird looking vegetable. That if I got that on my plate as a kid, I probably would have eaten it, but my sisters wouldn't have. You know. That personalizes it. That brings it home, right? All of a sudden, okay, I know this. I know the farmer. I met the farmer. I met the guy making the cheese at the farmer's market. Um, I, I, I took it home and I made something with it with my own hands. And that's all of a sudden, that level of engagement is better than any advertising. It's, it, it's, that's what really catches people. So where are we at today? Um, it is as diverse and a high quality. I travel, I used to travel all over the country uh, in my former job. I, I was on the road 15, 20 days a week. And there is no place like Oregon. You walk into a supermarket. I, walk, I would go back to New York where I grew up, and your green beans come wrapped in cellophane. I mean, there's none of this, let me go through, let alone at a farmer's market or a supermarket. That's it. I mean, it's like you get this. This is your one pound of green beans, and what's ever in there, that's what you get. Um, and there's not a lot of variety, and, and it's hard to get fresh produce. So, you know, as I travel around, I, I like going places because I like food, and so I'll, I'll make the point of going to some of those markets. and. You know, now in New York, you've got things like Italy or the Chelsea Farmers Market or anything where that's great, but you know, that's really people have to pay two, three times as much to buy that food um, as they do at their Pathmark or whatever you know, whatever supermarket they're, they're buying there from on the East Coast. So it's good that it's there, but it's really still not accessible. Um, we're in really good shape with that. We've got all these routes to market. We have all these channels, all these retailers, the direct capability. Um, I, you know, something that hasn't changed, how we're raising our animals here. Again, I'm, I'm not aware, you know, I'm not going to say that there aren't people here with bad habits, but there are no concentrated uh, organizations here. There are none of those CAFOs. We do a good job. And again, you know, you see a higher percentage of grass-fed beef and pasture-raised pork and free-range chickens. I mean, heck, in, in most of the metro area, you can grow chicken. You can have chickens on your own, right? You can put them in your backyard. It's terrific. Um, because of what happened with salmon, you know, in the 70s and 80s, we've got really good locally sustainable, sustainably managed uh, fisheries, not just for salmon, but for ground fish, for all the river fish, for everything like that, really high quality of, uh, of fish out here. Um, you know, again, I told you I wouldn't read every bullet, but the big thing is we make markets happen, right? There, those three things exist here that don't exist in almost any other one location, the growers, the, the, the processors, the consumers and everybody works together to make sure we have access to those products. And the good news is, you know, the more that this happens, and that example I used where Chelsea Market, you know, you're going to pay three times more for that green bean than you're going to pay for at Key Foods, um, the prices will drop as more and more people uh, are, are adhering to these growing practices and more and more people want, there's more demand for that food. It'll be a tipping point to, the, to where it won't be. And you're, you're almost seeing that happen with organics now. And organics is another term that's been a little bit co-opted. Generally, organic is better than non-organic. But I, if I have a chance to buy an organic chili, a grape from Chile, or a grape that was grown in California that's non-organic, but it's fairly, you know, well, you know, sustainably grown, I'll buy I'll buy the one that's not organic. I mean, it's to me those those things like carbon footprints and and you know all those things are also something we need in seasonality need to be taken into account. But the general thing is, like any other market, the more the market grows, the lower the costs are going to become, the easier it's going to be for consumers to have access to these things. So some of the folks that I'm aware of, and I've been lucky enough to work with some of these people, um, 
who are influencers today are listed on here. I mean, again, I'm not going to go through all of them, but if you look at it, it's a fairly comprehensive list. These are people who have, you know, in, in Oregon's recent history, had a major impact on the food that we're eating at all the levels I've been talking about. Slow Food is not, a port, it's not an Oregon-based organization. It's actually out of Europe, but there's a, uh, there's a chapter of it here in Oregon that's very active. Um, Portland Meat Collective, Camus Davis, she's, that was, I'll mention her because that's one of the things that got me on, the, on this path. When she first started teaching classes in whole animal butchery, or in whole animal butchery, I took one of those classes and really learned a lot about where meat comes from because she's not just about cut it up and eat it. It's very important to her that our animals are raised properly uh, and that we understand where our meat comes from uh, and, and all the, the social responsibility that goes along with being uh, a meat eater. And Ecotrust, I mean, again, unaware of of anywhere else in the country that has an organization like Ecotrust who their whole idea is to sustain uh, and preserve the land, the air, and the frozen. on um, You know, go to the establishment. Pop-up culture in, in Oregon is really solid right now. Eat different foods that are made by different people. Understand what their philosophy is. The, the, you know, how did that food get on your plate? Why, why is it here? Um, what, you know, does your food, you know, those, those are important things. It sounds a little pretentious to say things like, does your food have a message or does the chef have a voice? But in this context, it, it, it is kind of interesting and it is kind of important uh, to, to learn that and, and for chefs to have that. Yeah. I'd like to just add something to that list and that's Oregon State University, our land grant college, yep. particularly what I know about is their vegetable breeding yep. programs are just invaluable yep. for us farmers. They are, they are terrific, you're right about that. And I actually was going to put them on one of these slides and I forgot to as one of those uh, resources. That was a real <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't hear what you said. I said you'll never forget. Now I'll never forget, but no, what, what I was going to put them in is, as you said, and I don't know when OSU, can I, are you wearing brown and orange? Are you actually in beaver colors? I can't tell. But <laughs> Okay, okay, I, I thought I saw some orange. But um, the, uh, it's a land-grant university, as you said, and it was founded not too long after Oregon became a state, and that mission has been there. And I mean, I've done work, I've worked on projects with OSU with my customers and kitchen crew. I mean, to this day, if somebody wants to do, and I get it for the farmers and the seed programs, I know that uh, uh, the enology program there and creating a, uh, uh, a professor with Barney, uh, now I'm forgetting his name, Watson, Watson thank you. Um, who, who does, did a lot with grape uh, vine hybridization. But to this day, if I've got a client or anybody wants to sell commercially a product that's been canned, um, they go through Oregon State University to get certified as either low, acid, low acidification, high acidification, they get their certificate. FDA won't talk to them unless they've already been to OSU and taken the course. So yes, OSU is another state treasure that we've got. Well, that's an OSU. Yeah, the Food Innovation Center is actually an OSU and the Oregon Department of Ag joint venture. Did somebody mention that? No. Is there, is there any facet of, um, of your business where you wish that there was more support locally? Is there something you find that like, you're frustrated, like, oh, it's really hard to find this, and I wish somebody's done that? <laughs> <laughs> is this kind of what you're asking? Yes. Yeah. Um, you were starting to think, where can I find this? Were you talking about like ingredients and things like ingredients that? Ingredients or practices? Or yeah, mostly the practices, which is what this slide speaks to. I mean, in terms of ingredients, like I said, we have access to stuff now that you never would have dreamed of. I mean, and, and I'm lucky. I see that come through in Kitchen Crew all day long. I mean, finger limes, right? I mean, have you, anyone here know what finger limes are? They're, they're little limes that are about the size of the last two joints of your little finger. And when you, when you cut them open and squeeze them, little caviar pearls come out that are lime juice in these little caviar pearls. Uh, it's a citrus fruit that's native to uh, Australia, New Zealand, and they're growing it in California and other places now. I mean, you know, we talked about a Padron, pep Padron pepper example, but I mean, these, you know, oyster leaf lettuce and, 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 and uh, you know, all different chili peppers that because the, the Latin culture brings those up. I mean, it's, the, Anything you want, if you can't find it, you can find somebody who will grow it for you. Like we have hot sauce manufacturers who do that. They'll talk to a farmer and say, hey, will you grow me this chili because I found it down in New Mexico and it's great, but nobody's growing it up here. Um, you know, things like that. So not so much from the ingredients. The big barriers are going to be 
regulatory and some of the things I'm going to talk about now. And I'm, I'm just going to use a few examples. So um, anything that, any product that contains meat or dairy has to be USDA certified. It's really, or it has to be produced in a USDA certified facility. Really hard to do, it takes two years, you've got to physically modify most facilities. Um, so there's a big barrier to entry there. It's also an issue with um, small farms that want to do uh, animal slaughter because there's only a few, very few USDA approved slaughter facilities and most of them don't want to just do three cows that you bring through the door. They've, they're dealing with people who are bringing in thousands of steer a year. And so it's really hard for a small rancher, they don't have to a slaughter process, you know, kind of the, the, uh, the secret police about raw milk in the last few years. If you haven't, you should educate yourself on this. You know, raw milk as a home cheese maker, love access to raw milk, but the FDA makes it nearly impossible to get raw milk because they're afraid of things like E. coli contamination. Yeah. How does like uh, Vermont do? How does what? Vermont. Well, different, what, what you can do is you can have a, um, you have an exemption. You can buy a certain amount of raw milk from, directly from a farmer, or if you have a farm, you can use it yourself. Um, so how Vermont, Vermont may just have more uh, people who are willing to sell to the general public as small farms. But it's like seven gallons a year or something like that. It's a really small amount that the FDA will let you do. And they are busting farmers who are doing this. They are, I mean, they are, they are raiding farms around the country where people are selling raw milk. There are issues with raw milk, don't get me wrong. If you don't take care of it, if you get contamination, there's E. coli. You know, pregnant women can have issues with some of the, some of the, you know, the microflora and microfauna that are, that are in raw milk. But in general, it's better for you. It's probiotic. It makes food taste better when you make cheese from it. Um, but the FDA is making it nearly impossible for us to get it unless you actually own a cow. Um, Corporations, I mean, big agriculture, they're not giving up. I mean, you, you know, like I said, they spent 22 million or whatever it was against, uh, you know, the uh, GMO labeling uh, measure here in Oregon. They're still doing, uh, you know, they're still producing these. I, I just saw the, the FDA just approved a GMO potato. I don't know if you saw that just like two weeks ago, um, which is, uh, you know, an issue. A big issue for farmers, too, is the seeds. And I don't know if you've had this issue or not, but this whole thing like where, where Remember when I said earlier that how farmers used to have seed is they'd save some seed from the year before and then put it in the ground? They don't let you do it now. If you buy some of these GMO seeds from Monsanto or some of these other producers, they tell you that's my copyrighted trademark seed. You are in, you are in uh, a trademark violation. You have to for me next year. Uh, so there's some pretty shady business practice. And now you're seeing Genetically, the trout gene. You do spray as much as it won't but it's going to do that. But that, you know, that's where things are, are and where they're headed. Um, so the biggest thing we can do is educate ourselves and educate our friends and family and just, like I said, just try to, try to do what you can where you are. Um, you know, give it as best to go as you can. For, at the personal level, eating habits are, am I paying attention to where is that food traceability? Where did this come from? And why is it on the shelf? And, and is this where I should spend my dollar? Um, and then systemically, you know, again, understand, again, I know these are big, big, big concepts, but the food shed, sustainability, it gets to ecosystems. Just good stewardship. Um, and again, the big thing is it's got to reach a tipping point to where the producers can afford to do it and, and that people will buy it and it's affordable enough for their customers that, that uh, it reaches that critical mass to where it's not just, okay, I can buy the, you know, the sustainably grown or the non-sustainably grown. It's just everything we have here is, is you know, good stuff. Here's a very short bibliography. I mean, these first two books by Michael Pollan, I read them well before I had any idea I was going to go through a career change and, and, and be a part of this, uh, be a part of the food community, but they were, uh, they were very uh, instrumental in my developing my own philosophy about how I feel about these things, and they're very readable. They're not dense scientific things. He's, he's a very good author. And then I'm only three chapters into it, and I probably should have skimmed ahead because I would have had a lot more history about farms and things like that, 
but a lady named Heather Arndt Anderson here in Portland just published a book in November called Portland, a Food Biography. I'm only three chapters into it, and it's just, it's really fascinating. I mean, she goes way back to uh, native peoples and kind of how they, you know, Root and fished and did all those things. And I'm, I'm right now I'm up to you know the Oregon Trail is just kind of getting here. That's kind of what the early farms were like. And look at that. That was my 50 minute timer. So are there any questions? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, Tobias. Um, so in terms of um, in terms of a lot of the arguments that during the um, during the recent um, election, a lot of the arguments against um, labeling GMOs were that they would, they would hurt um, they would hurt small farms and um, I, I guess one of it was was uh, one, of, one of the arguments in that area of argumentation was that um, it had to do with labeling um, like relabeling product that you like you brought up so like if you were to have to um, so you you switch the, the the spray that you were using and how much how much was the cost to, to All the checks. Probably about, about 800 bucks for 2,000 labels. But you got to remember, most farmers aren't packaging their food like that. The, right. You know, the argument that they were trying to make was, as far as I could tell, because all they would do is they would have you know some attractive lady farmer up there saying this is going to cost me too much money. <laughs> but she never said what the money was going to be. Right. You know, so but but from talking and reading, I mean, from what I could say, it was like okay, lower yields on the farm because you know you can't use the systemic right. I don't, I'm not buying that Roundup resistant seed so now I've got a I've got a you know farm in other ways you know because I'm not using that GMO product um, you know they were trying to convince you that people would buy less of the product if it had that you know contains GMOs you know again I think outside of Oregon I think very few people are tuned into that yet I don't think that that was going to be the issue I do know that the folks who were uh, advocating for measure 92 provided some research that said here in these countries in Europe um, where it was, where it was, you know, there is non-GMO labeling, or there's GMO labeling, uh, that they thought it did not increase the, the cost of the food at all. But whether that what that did to the farmers, I don't know. But I mean, I, I was never really clear on where they said it was going to cost the farmers money. Uh, it wouldn't cost them anything unless they wanted to put the GMO label. They can continue it just the way they were right. now and not put GMO and, label. And by the way, it wasn't like it's going to be okay tomorrow. You have to say non-GMO or GMO, right? There's a runway. It was, right. you know, it was like a two-year runway or something like that. So even if they had, if I had those two thousand labels, I had plenty of time to print yeah, them. Yeah, I guess. I mean, to be totally honest, like, and my expectation was that to replace two thousand labels was not like this, you know sufficient huge cost. I mean, it was. It was. You gave me the answer. You know, that was, I mean, th that was one of the things that bugged me particularly about the campaign being someone who's grown up um, with, um, well, not precisely, but been around farms for for quite a while now, and uh, and the idea that it would hurt small farm farms, the farms seem really fictitious, and th th I, that as an argument was one that like. I can't really that answer my question. Yeah, I, I think it was all smoke and mirrors. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, you briefly mentioned it before, but just a little bit about um, how nutrition um, affects the consumer and maybe how the consumer is not aware of how much nutrition affects them, or mobily grown and sustainable. Well, so I'm going to, I mean, there's, there's kind of two, there's a lot of answers to that, but I'll you know, talk about two. One is fresh produce, fresh proteins. Um, if something is bred to look good, be durable, grow more white meat, um, be, uh, be uh, systemic resistant, um, it's, it's everything but what are, you know, you, you, some of it you know what you're doing, right? You, you're, you're making corn sweeter so it's got higher levels of simple carbohydrates in it. Simple carbohydrates, which are sweet, aren't necessarily good because you know, your body wants complex carbohydrates to be more healthy. Um, uh, you know, the same thing with the tomato. I mean, how much vitamin A and vitamin C is brought out of a tomato through the process of, you know, making it not bruise when it ships to market. So part of it is what's, you know, uh, and, and we're just now discovering, and I say just now discovering, it's a big deal. I mean, there are, 
there's a whole science of micronutrients that are in foods and enzymes and things that you're just now discovering um, can have a really good effect or a really bad effect in a relatively narrow bandwidth of whether you get enough of it or not. Um, that's beyond just you know the eight vitamins that everyone's aware of. Um, and the same thing so goes true for soils, by the way. I mean, a big part about no-till soiling is to maintain that micro-life that's in the soil, and, and uh, uh, that tilling will actually destroy as well as, as well as chemicals. But then the other part of it is the processed food, right? I mean, unfortunately, most people now get their, don't get their major calories from fresh food. They get it from processed food. And again, what the manufacturers have figured out is if we, if we put enough fat, sugar, and salt in it, it's going to taste really good, and that's what people are going to buy. Um, and so uh, the, the processing piece of it, I think, has one of your, one of your questions, or part of your question, I think, was to kind of quantify how bad it can be. Processed food can be really, really bad. Um, so, uh, you, uh, you highlight some ways that you can avoid the consumer in that way? Or maybe the consumers? Well, I mean, you know, again, I, you know, my, my way of doing it is to get delicious food in their hands that, you know, can be almost as convenient as, you know, pouring a jar of ragu into a, into a pot. You know, at least if you're not going to use fresh tomatoes, at least use canned tomatoes that all they contain is tomatoes and ascorbic acid, you know. Um, but there's, there is, there are, and I'll use this marinara example, there is marinara sauce out there that has more sugar in it and more calories ounce for ounce than Hershey. Why? Because that's what's going to make it taste good. So, you know, I don't know that there's one thing. I mean, we talk, you know, you hear about school lunch programs and educating people in food deserts and this and that, but there's so many, like I said, that big programmatic stuff, it hardly ever works. The best thing I can think of is everybody has their philosophy as individuals. When you cook for people at home or if you just cook for yourself at home, make the right decisions. When you're with people eating out or in their home or in your home, talk about the, you know, talk about the food. I mean, I love that. I mean, I, you know, I get it. I'm a food geek, and maybe not everybody is. But, you know, if I, if I serve somebody a rack of pork that's from Tails and Trotters, and I know that it was hazelnut finished up in southwest Washington, and, or I'm getting a, get, I, I break a hog down from Square Deal Farms or Square Peg Farms, and, you know, I know that it was finished in an apple orchard, you know, for the last six weeks of its life, eating blowdowns. I mean, those are kind of cool things. Or I met the farmer who grew the Romesco. Or, I, you know, guess what? I just learned that, you know, Leslie and Manuel from Viridian, uh, you know, are the ones who brought in, uh, you know, Padron peppers and oyster leaf lettuce. I mean, it's, it's, it's a I think it's a groundswell. And I do think there are organizations that can help. But I don't know. I'm, I'm not confident that, uh, you know, government's going to get it done with school lunch programs. <laughs> yeah? How did I what? I'm sorry. And it's switching from computers to food. Oh, I like to eat. No, um, I uh, well, I have a very indulgent wife uh, who let me make the change. But yeah, I, I did that for 26 years, and as I said, I was I, I did it for IBM. I actually moved out here in '87. I worked for IBM. I left IBM in '96. Started my own company. Got acquired. Did some acquiring. Social responsibility to it. And I spent a lot of time researching green and alternative energy sources. And I thought that I could get involved in that industry, whether, you know, and, and it just wasn't there. I mean, this was 2008, 2009, and the industry was, and I still don't think it's very mature, you know, you know people who were making solar cells, well, that was already getting offshore to China. Um, I talked to companies like Vestas and GE about wind power, and because I didn't have 10 years' experience in the utility industry, they didn't want to talk to me. I talked to some guys up in Vancouver, BC, about using tides as energy, and they, you know, had me convinced that this was all ready to go. And then it turned out that it was just three engineers waiting for an investor. So I said, okay, this probably isn't, you know, a realistic way to go. And you know, the real um, aha moment for me is during that year off I had two or th I made two or three friends who were in the food different things in the food business and that was where I learned that there are people who have all these great ideas and a lot of passion and all the energy in the world to create delicious food and they don't have a single idea about how to turn that into money and run a successful business and if you think back to 2009 which is kind of what we're into now that was when the food cart thing was was first starting to happen and so I just asked myself where are these guys cooking their food and how are they getting it sold? And that was what started me down the path. You know, ironically, we ended up not having a high percentage of food carts as clients, not because the business opportunity wasn't there, but that's a different business model. That I've only carts who went brick and mortar.
mortar. So if they needed a place to kind of help them get to a brick and mortar stage. But that was it. I mean, it just kind of led me down that path. And, and then uh, I'd go to farmer's markets or, and, and talk to people who were selling finished goods and ask them where they were making it and how that worked. And um, I'd read label, you know, fi find manufacturers off of the shelf at New Seasons and get in touch and kind of do the same thing. And that was that. So, yeah. So you have, you have like, through this whole thing, you have kind of a really systematic and holistic approach to the business and to the way you look at a lot of things just based on how you've been talking about a lot of this stuff. Is there any other facet of life or any other subject matter that you kind of have that much passion for or a similar amount that you try and incorporate into or maybe have a future plan, like, for instance, uh, alternative energy and, like, or something like that? Is there anything else as a person? It's a good question. Right, right now, I think my immediate and intermediate future is bagels. I mean, <laughs> we're, 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 I mean, and thank you. Know, you. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, we're, you know, we're. If, if you had told me two years ago that I'd be averaging 32, 3300 bagels a night, delivering to 114, I, I wouldn't have believed it. I mean, I thought it was just going to be this little side project at a kitchen crew. Um, but there's a real opportunity there, and, I, and, and you know, I think. Um, I think it's as a result of a lot of the stuff we're talking about. I think we're, we're using better ingredients. I think we're making, we're using artisan techniques to, to make, I mean, it takes me two days to make a bagel. It takes my competition about four hours, but I mean, I'm making them the way they were made. They don't make a bagel. They make a roll with a hole in the bagel. Thank you. <laughs> most of them, most of them. Most of them are doing a good job, but, but none of them are doing a two-day cold fermented rice like we are, you know? It's, it's just there's certain techniques. So I think my, like I said, I think right now I'm focused on bagels. We're in about an 1,100 square foot bakery right next door to Kitchen Crew. I'm in the process of looking for a lot more space so that we can expand. So I, I think I think I've got my hands full with other projects right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about how Kitchen Crew works if you're a food entrepreneur, and and are you sort of synergistic with the OSU Center for Food Innovation or in I'll, competition? I'll answer with? that second one. Yes, we are. Um, they were actually uh, when I started doing my research, I discovered that organization exists. Sarah Masoni over there. I uh, was one of the first people I talked to when I started doing my research because I wanted to make sure that we weren't going to be in competition. You know, I, I, you know, last thing I needed to do was go up against the ODA and Oregon State University. I mean, why would I do that? And it turns out we do have different missions. They're very much food scientists. They're all about once you have a product, how can I package it properly so it, I have maximum shelf life? How can I do it so that it ships? If it's a frozen food, how long can it stay frozen? What's my freezing method? I mean, they're, they do sensory things, so they actually do the blind taste test. As a matter of fact, you should get on their mailing list because they will call you or email you and say, hey, we're going to be doing a, uh, a sensory tasting thing for, you know, I don't know, kale chips uh, next week. And if you can come by, you know, you're going to taste 10 or 12 different kinds of kale chips or things like that. And then you do the interviews and focus groups. It's really kind of cool. So they're very much scientists. I'm very much about production and distribution. So we send people to each other. So if they have somebody who comes there and they have a product and they don't have a place to produce it, they will sometimes refer to us. If I have somebody who says, hey, I'm doing this thing, but I need to know what my shelf life's going to be before I go tell New Seasons, I send them over to, and I've used them for Bowery as well. In terms of how Kitchen Crew works, uh, it's very free form. I mean, we'll entertain almost any opportunity. I've only turned one client away, um, and that was because he wanted to process fish. And it's not that the facility couldn't handle it. It's just that the, the lingering odors and things would have just been you know, too tough on the other customers. But basically, uh, people come to me and they say, I either have an idea or I have a product that I'm already selling through some channel, whether it's a farmer's market or, you know, a food co-op or something like that. We'll do an interview. We'll figure out, you know, what kind of resources they need from the kitchen. Um, I'll educate them on what it takes. What, there's a lot of romance around the food business, right? Everyone, it's all, you know, it's all food network all the time. And it's, oh, my chef, my chef and my crisp whites. When you're selling a product, you're a manufacturer. So, you know, you may have grandma's, you know, salsa recipe that she got brought with her from the old country and you've been making it, you know, six quarts at a time at home. But once you want to sell 200 cases a week of it, you're a manufacturer. Now, the food still has to be delicious. And that's the trick. How do you get from six quarts to 200 cases and maintain that product quality? And that's what we help them do. That's what we help them do, and it's a variety of things from educating them on production techniques and uh, commercial equipment to something simple like converting your recipes to weight because, you know, the last thing you want to do is scale up your recipe a hundred times and have to measure out a hundred half right? <laughs> so some of it is how does the equipment work? I mean, I'll tell you, the first time I made bagels in Kitchen Crew, I crashed and failed. 
turns out that speed two on a 60 quart whole barn mixer is way different from low on a home kitchen aid. It turns out that a blodgett convection oven cooks way different from a from a decor convection oven. You know, it's the equipment is different. Mm -hmm. It's the store. There's good re I mean, I think all are, they're all good. So I'm going to start by saying whether you say you farm organically, sustainably, if you're really doing sustainable things, or, bio, or uh, biodynamically, they're all good choices. But there's reasons why you would do one or over the other. There are certain products that it is really hard to get an organic certification for. Um, and it can be expensive. And so uh, you, might, you might, I'm, I'm familiar, uh, there's a firm out of Milwaukee, Washington called Starvation Alley Cranberries. Uh, and by the way, you see their product around town. It's terrific. It's, they do uh, this uh, cold pressed cranberry juice that's like nothing you can eat. It's not meant to just drink. You, you make drinks with it. You, you use it as an ingredient. But anyway, so they have two, farm, two bogs that they own. And then they're working with six other farmers. Two or three of their farms they've had certified organic. But it takes three years to get certified organic. So what they're doing is those other farms that they own and that they're in there I don't want to say they're co-op because I don't think they are, but that are selling to the Starvation Alley brand. They're practicing the organic farming techniques, but they haven't gotten the certification. Because the certification, they will, and it takes three years. But some farms just never do because it's an expensive process to go through and to maintain. There's a lot of record keeping. Um, you've got to pay attention to what your neighboring farms are doing. You've got to worry about what your you know, if you're using animal fertilizer, what did the animals eat? You may not know if you don't own that animal. So I mean, it's it, it's a difficult thing. Sustainable, there's no standard for. Well, there are. There's the standard, right? There are not for most agricultural products, um, and I think Oregon led the way on what it is for wine with the salmon safe thing. I think that might have been the first one. Um, so there are certain things like that. And then biodynamic is like, that's part religion. Right? Yeah. So, so I know people who are growing wine or other vegetables who are doing the biological part of biodynamic, but they're not doing the star chart part of biodynamic. It all depends on what you want to do. It all depends on what you want to do. Did I answer the question? Or? I mean, yeah, I guess I just, if you think sustainable, if it is certified sustainable, like Most agricultural products do not have any kind of a sustainable certification that they can go through like in the wine industry. And I think like with your thing you said about organic, like I've been at the farmer's market where someone has asked the farmer if it's organic and they say no, the person like drops it and like runs away like it's the, you know, the black death. Dude. But like, you know, I stayed there and the farmer looked at me and he goes, it's grown, you know, it's grown organically, I can't get it certified, you know, because mm -hmm. And you know, like you just said, it's a giant process. Yeah, so I think that's something like that's important for everyone here to kind of know and share. Like, yeah. ask the, the follow-up question. Just because it says yeah. it's not organic doesn't necessarily mean and that's it's all those other bad things. Yes, yeah, and that's part of the education process, right? We got to educate people about food that's grown better. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, organic is not the be-all end-all. People people make their personal choice. They decide they want to be buy 100% organic food. That's better than buying, you know, you know, those the crops that are grown using poor practices. I, I can't pick on them, but again, I, I think we can all be a little bit more uh, Catholic in our tastes when it comes to understanding that there's different levels of what's good, you know, properly grown food versus not. So. All right. Yes, sir. Just one thing. Uh, Ma'am. Uh, <laughs> it's, the, it's the lights. Bagels are my favorite thing, and thankfully the coffee shop next door to my house carries. Great. Um, Who is it? Do you mind my asking which one it is? Uh, at the 26 Cafe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very good. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, and then, but even more than bagels, I like wine. And, um, <laughs> 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 the breakfast you, one's not. Uh, you can actually make a bagel wine club where I could sit and drink wine with you. But anyway, so I saw the remedy the other day, too, and I was very impressed with my experience there. I'm curious, you have talked a lot about bagels, but, like, how did you get into wine? 
I love wine. I mean, I love food, but I love wine. And um, I grew up. I grew up. My my uh, my mother's parents were Italian. Right? I mean, like straight off the boat, Italian, and, and they were kind of my daycare growing up. A lot of my you know my earliest memories of cooking and also eating were you know big family meals, and there was always wine on the table. And in that culture, from a very young age, I always had access to drink a little bit of watered down wine or a little bit of wine at the end of the meal. So I, now it wasn't always the best wine. You know, my grandfather loved his Carlo Rossi, you know, and he loved his liquor, so. But I had a taste for it early on, and then I had a chance when I was in school to live over in Spain for a year, uh, and I really developed, you know, a little bit more of a palate about it. But really, the biggest thing was when we moved out here to Oregon in 87, it was, you know, it was just at the knee of the curve. I mean, um, David Lett. Uh, over at uh, at Irie Vineyards and uh, Dick E. Raff at News and E. Raff had been they had planted in the late '60s and early '70s, but they were alone for a while. And it wasn't until uh, like the early '80s, Domaine Joanne from Burgundy and a couple of other you know people started really getting and you know making major land investments to grow grapes. Um, when I came here, they were just releasing the 1985 vintage, which to, to date was the best vintage that had happened in Oregon. And they were they released that in eighty seven eighty eight right when I moved here and so and the neat thing was you know I could drive thirty minutes from where I lived and visit a winery and not just taste the wine but see how the grapes are grown understand viticulture talk to the you know at that point you know you could still talk to David Lett or uh, uh, Dick Ponzi and some of those folks who are making the wine and learn about it I could you could ask any question they could answer any question you go into the barrel room so I, I caught the bug and I think. Um, you know, I, I think my first time I made wine, I think was 1997, but I, you know, I just, I just, it's, wine is one of those things where it seems, it can seem really elitist and really snobby, but it's just like anything, you know, it's one of these things where there's an infinite variety, there is literally an infinite variety of wine, either what grape is, what type of grape is grown, where it's grown, you know, in, in, the, in the world. And year to year, I mean, you know, 10 more days of rain will make a difference from year to year, or, you know, two degree days. So the only thing I can tell you is I, I caught the bug. And, it, you know, again, I think because I grew up in a family where wine is food, you know, it was, it was, it's never been separated. Thank you. Yes, sir. So the only thing that can make a uh, buttered bagel better is bacon. Do you, are you thinking of selling bacon as a deli, you know, half pound of bacon, or is it so, just on your sandwich? Remember what I said about the USDA thing and selling mm -hmm. meat to the public, and because we also cure our own pastrami, and I think we could we could sell a lot of that pastrami as well. So the answer is I can't now, but by the first of the year I think I'll be able to. So just stay Both tuned. Both pastrami and bacon. Yes. Oh. Yes. And and uh, smoked fish. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> stay tuned. <laughs> it only gets better. Yeah. Hopefully. Thank you. Yes. As former New Yorkers, thank you for the Bowery Bagels, but what is your memory of New York and bagels and bakeries that maybe got you into this? So when I first, when I moved out here, as I said, in 87, and there wasn't a good bagel. So at one point, going back and forth to my mother's house, I dug out a few of her cookbooks. I got two or three recipes, and I just, through trial and error, kind of came up with my recipe, which is basically the same one that we use. But the bagel that I was trying to recreate is, um, I grew up in an area uh, in Brooklyn called Ridgewood, and then later in Woodhaven, Queens. So that's kind of the, the area I was in. And there was a, a small, there was a German bakery there that had three bakeries, one in Ridgewood, one in Woodhaven, and one, I forget the neighborhood, but it was up by Christ the King High School, if you guys remember whatever neighborhood that was. Middle Village. Thank you, Middle Village, that's right. So um, every day, walking home from church, St. Thomas the Apostle, every Sunday, we would stop and we'd get a bag of bagels um, from Glendale Bakery, and some, we call them cream donuts, now they're called Bismarck's because it was a German bakery, they had great ones, and crullers. And then two blocks down was the Italian bakery, Mondello's, and we would get our bread there and we would get some cannoli or pastry, whatever we were gonna have that night. So, but we always, every Sunday, had a bagel. And that was the bagel that when I started making bagels, I tried to, I tried to recreate. So, they're not there anymore, so I can't, I don't know how close <laughs> I got. <laughs> Yeah, no more knishes, no more eight creams. And yeah, stuff. we're going to start doing knishes. We are going to start doing knishes soon, sooner rather than later. I hope to have them up by the holidays. So, how are we doing, Tobias? Can I keep asking questions, or are we? If there's more questions. No, there's not. All right. Well, listen. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed doing this. Thank you, Tobias, and Will. Um,
next week's support of Bowery and Remedy. Thank you. Sweet. All right. Um, we return April 7th with uh, Carl Andles Anderson of Futel with his talk, Futel, the Telephone of the Future, today. At first glance, Futel is nothing more than a collection of pay phones installed in publicly accessible locations, no different than the phones found on every street corner, except one doesn't have to pay to use them. And if the caller doesn't have a human to interact with, one will be provided. And there aren't any pay phones around anymore anyway. <laughs> Find out what they hope to achieve by starting a free telephone network. They will discuss their spiritual ancestors in the phone freak and mail artist community, as well as their philosophical background in creating useful and non-useful devices out of discarded junk and the importance of Projects with back practical. Trump six 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 he created amphibious human powered vehicles out of trash. With Church of Robotron, he has built a post apocalyptic training facility and Dr. Coin on the yeah, ass. I'll hang around if